Hello, there we go. There's the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, me llamo Chris Rosen, and that is about the extent of the talk that will be in Spanish here for the rest of my time, at least. So I apologize uh, on behalf of my lack of Spanish skills, despite four strong years of high school Spanish. Really excited to be here. I am in offering management. Ultimately, that means I'm responsible for some of our public cloud offerings that we run. We're going to focus today and talk about open source and the open source community and how we contribute and also leverage and build on top of open source projects. When we talk to our customers, the reality is that their environments are extremely complex. Whether they're running workloads on-prem, which there will be workloads that will continue to run on-prem for the foreseeable future, if not indefinitely. Then, when we start to think about expanding some of that workload out to public cloud, maybe different teams have started a new project, or we're starting that modernization journey. But the reality is, it's very complex. When you think about the range of infrastructures that your teams are supporting, it's very difficult to understand a governance model that's in place, an overarching security or monitoring or logging strategy to help drive those needs. And that's really why, when you think about it, only roughly 20% of workloads have moved to cloud thus far because of the complexities with the rest of the 80%. So obviously it made sense to start with that 20%. Let's take what we would call the low-hanging fruit, the easier workloads, the new cloud-native, the, the microservices-based architectures, let's move those to the cloud or develop those in the cloud because it's just easier. Let's start with something, let's get have some success. Now we can start to target the more complex, the rest of that 80% of the workloads that we have and get those moved into the public cloud. So I think the title on my slide was about leveraging open source and using that because the other thing that I talk to customers a lot about is portability, eliminating vendor lock-in. I want to be able to take my thing and I want to be able to move it here or here or there and have consistency from a user experience, a developer experience. And that's why we think open source is extremely important to help with that. Now, this slide is meant to highlight kind of the longevity that IBM has had in the open source community. With the acquisition of Red Hat that just closed about a month ago, we get asked a lot about, you know, what is that going to mean for Red Hat? Clearly, they have a very strong open source foundation. And how is that going to change now that IBM has acquired them? Well, it's very clear from this chart that IBM has a long heritage and history in not only investing in by contributing to various open source projects, but also consuming them and building our offerings on top of these open source projects. When you look back, 20 years ago, IBM invested in Linux. And at the time, you know, that was obviously a pretty, you know, challenging thing to get involved with from an IBM perspective when you think about OS2 at the time or Windows. But as we progressed, we really strategically select the open source projects where we can see things like a strong governance model, obviously a value for something, some problems that that community is solving. And on the far right of this, we've got a number of things, more modern technologies where IBM has invested in, whether it's Cloud Foundry with an opinionated way to run containers, or the Open Container Initiative seeded by Docker, or newer things like Kubernetes with the CNC app. And there are many more projects that are coming out all the time where IBM is open sourcing content in really working collaboratively with the ecosystem. Because that's really the strength and the power is not for me to develop code, but for all of us to be able to develop code. And by doing so in a controlled governance, 
um, manner, then we can do that more efficiently and we can all benefit and work collaboratively to help accelerate that growth and accelerate adoption of those projects. As I said, when we think about it, and we have groups in IBM that their focus is upstream open source projects to be able to contribute code, to make sure that, that we've got the right focus around things like documentation, user experience. It's not just the technology. The technology is great and we love to go out and play with new things, but if it's not consumable, upgradable, secure, performant, all the things that we need if we want to actually use these projects, then it's really of no use. So we think about, you know, are we doing so in a model that has responsible licensing? We don't want to be too restrictive. We want to allow the power of these projects to be consumed by a lot of different teams. Because again, the adoption, the, the multiple teams that are leveraging it, that's where they continue to grow and evolve. Obviously, we want a very active ecosystem. It, it doesn't do any good for just IBM or just someone else, just you to contribute code. We need all of us to be active participants in that ecosystem. And you'll see some of the newer projects, there's a lot, there's a very vibrant, growing ecosystem. Hopefully, you've had a chance to get to something like a DockerCon or a KubeCon or an OzCon. There's a lot of cons out there where you can go to these conferences and learn what's happening in the ecosystem as well as from the commercial side. So there's, you know, we really look for those projects that have and align with uh, these uh, requirements here. So we've talked about some. There's others, obviously, with Open Liberty, um, Java, other open source projects that we're very active in. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not, in my time here, talk about IBM Cloud and some of the things that we're doing in our public cloud platform. Clearly, you know, hopefully this is not new news that we announced the acquisition of Red Hat, uh, well, leaked back in October, and it became official about six weeks ago. All right, let's try this. Now I'm double microphoned. So fast forward to today, and we're obviously really excited because during that period from October to a month ago, we couldn't talk to you about what our plans were with Red Hat. We couldn't even talk to Red Hat about what our plans were collaboratively with them. So now today, we're able to, to set that strategy and focus, and I did catch at least some of the, the kickoff where you know, we're building and using OpenShift as that platform layer to provide content like IBM Cloud Packs, like Red Hat Middleware, in a consistent manner, regardless of where you want to run that environment. So in your data centers, in IBM Cloud, or in some other public cloud as well. There are five key tenants when we think about IBM Cloud, and I. I threw in the Red Hat chart beforehand because Red Hat has the same beliefs in, in their, the way that they deliver software and go to market. The first is around hybrid. And again, the reality is you've got systems of record. You've got resources that will remain in your data center. We're not advocating that everything should move today. But there are ways to leverage and make that data that's already there smarter through new systems of engagement. How do I leverage higher value services to make my application smarter? How do I build cognitive capabilities like Watson into my app so that way now I can integrate and talk to my customers in a more meaningful manner because I've got some cognitive capabilities behind my application and I can give them targeted offers or targeted communications that directly affect them. The second thing is around multi-cloud. The reality is that our customers in the world are running in two or more public clouds whether that's different teams that have started in different clouds or maybe there's disaster recovery from one cloud to another or just simply there's some other use cases or requirements that are met in one and not in, in another. 
So with that multi-cloud approach, there's a lot of challenges because each public cloud provider will have a different way to handle monitoring and logging and identity and access management. So we need a way to abstract that complex environment. The third thing which we talked about is being open source. And it's great that we're building on open source projects. So you've got that portability, you've got that, you've eliminated that vendor lock-in, but there's also a lot of concerns about open source projects. Are they secure? Um, can I run my code using open source? And that's really what IBM is focused on is hardening and solidifying these open source projects and running them at scale. Because if we flash back to the previous chart that showed all the different projects that we're working in, they're really designed and work great in a single tenant environment on your laptop. But as soon as you start running them at scale and multi-tenancy and you start rolling out from dev to QA to production, you need to make sure that those projects can scale and run efficiently. So that's really where IBM is focused to make sure that those projects are in fact scalable. The fourth thing, if you've ever heard Ginny Rometty, which is our CEO and president of IBM talk, inevitably you've heard her say the words, IBM cloud is secure to the core. That is one of the key tenants with our public cloud offering. And we think about security through every layer in the stack and making it easier for our users, our target personas are typically developers. We wanna make it easy to consume security policies throughout the entire life cycle. Security is not just some checkbox at the end of the development cycle where we say, yep, here's the security checklist. Else that's gonna result in a lot of rework going back and making sure that whatever we've just built is actually secure. So we need to bring security to the forefront all the way to this initial design thinking when we start to plan our next release to make sure that we've got security in mind. And it's just the next evolution from DevOps where we took development and we took operations and we put them together so that way we could move faster and deliver software in a more meaningful manner. Now we've got DevSecOps because security is an important critical piece in the middle of both of those. And then number five is around management. So we talked about complexity and it really, the reality is complexity, whether it's hybrid cloud or multi-cloud. So to have management tools that give you an abstraction, an overlay, a common way to run containers like OpenShift, to be able to do that in a consistent manner, regardless of where you wanna run that software but also giving you multi-cloud management. And I encourage you to stick around to the demo that is right after me, because they're gonna show you how to use multi-cloud management, how you can get insights to your containerized workloads that are deployed here, there, or anywhere. So it's really about that consistency. In IBM Cloud, obviously we've got normal cloud infrastructure things that you would expect, virtual machines, bare metal, networks, load balancers, uh, but we also have other system architectures that you won't find elsewhere, like Power or Z with new the, some of the new modern mainframes. And bringing that all as part of managed services. And when I say managed services, it means IBM is going to take this line in the responsibility and maintain everything down here. So that way you as a consumer, you just focus on innovation, delivering that line of business objectives that you have, not maintaining all these open source projects because it's a very complex stack. And if something new comes out, can I upgrade it or will it break everything else in the stack? Well, let IBM handle that for you. You focus on your competitive differentiation. So I was told we would have a very technical astute group that would wanna hear more about the technical details of what we're doing and take it down a couple of levels. So that's what the next few charts are. We're gonna progress through and get deeper into the technology. As I've said, we've got you know, normal public cloud IaaS resources that you would expect, but we've really focused a lot on what we call our developer experience tools. Because again, the developers are the main personas that we want to enable and empower to allow them, give them access to these new tools and capabilities and deliver software faster. So when you think about a very complex architecture, it's not one size fits all from a compute perspective. 
Sometimes bare metal or virtual machines may work, but sometimes I may need Cloud Foundry, or I may need containers and Kubernetes to handle that complex orchestration, or all the way at the top thinking about IBM Cloud Functions, which is our event-driven serverless capability, where essentially you've got a piece of your architecture that doesn't need to run all the time. It's just sitting and waiting and listening. And then as soon as that trigger takes place, then it calls and takes some other action, whether it's running script, running this file, running a command. And in a complex architecture, you're gonna need a mix of these different compute choices to make sure that you can run as efficiently as possible. Containers are ephemeral, meaning that they can, they will either be replaced with new versions or they can crash. So we need a way to store that data outside the life cycle of containers. So that way when the container does crash, I'm not losing my logs or my customer data or whatever I've stored inside that container. And again, using something like a managed database, let that team figure out how to handle HA and DR and backups and all the DBA type capabilities. And you, again, just focus on populating the database with the things that are important to you. And then, you know, last thing here is around consuming higher value services from IBM Cloud. So whether it is back to using Watson or IoT or analytics or weather data, to be able to consume those within your application, whether it's a new cloud native app or you've just modernized something to start running in IBM Cloud. Now you deploy that instance of Watson and you securely and easily bind it to that application. Now your app is automatically smarter because it's using some speech to text or visual recognition but in conjunction with that existing traditional app, you've not had to change any code and now you're consuming those in a very secure manner. And Maris, we'll talk about them in a second. Uh, it's a pretty good use case on what they were doing. So we're, we're going down lower and lower into the weeds of uh, technical capabilities here. Because you know the future, if you're not already using containers, to deliver software faster, to be able to move quicker, to be able to deliver innovation, I can assure you that your competitors are. So I would strongly encourage you to think about how you deliver software. Containerization is all about portability and speed and breaking down the different capabilities into smaller chunks. So now my individual teams can go out and develop new capabilities individually of each other, or they can scale out different components of the architecture without adversely affecting everyone else. And it's, it's really about portability because we've all been in the situation where something works in my environment, it doesn't work in yours, clearly that's your problem. Well, containers will package up the application and all of its dependencies into one thing. Now I can take that thing and I can run it anywhere consistently. That's really the power of containers. And Kubernetes as a container orchestration platform is really about simplifying things around deployments and upgrades and DNS and load balancing, all the complexities that, are, that come along with a microservices architecture, Kubernetes is there to solve that. And with IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service, it's our managed Kubernetes offering where we handle kind of the backend plumbing of lifecycle management around deployments, upgrade management, whether it's operating system patches, vulnerability remediations, or anything in that complex Kubernetes stack, we're gonna manage that for you, again, letting you just focus on innovation. Within IKS, we, we really focus on customer data because obviously it's very important to you. You put trust in us to be able to run those workloads in IBM Cloud. So you'll see things like HIPAA readiness and PCI compliance and SOC 1 and SOC 2 and, and all these compliance certifications that are required to show GDPR, to show how we're protecting the data on your behalf. And I don't know if you can see it at floor level up here, um, but you'll see some little badges. And these are from the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. 
conformance testing. And essentially what it means is that we're using upstream Kubernetes from the ecosystem. So the same CLIs and APIs and consistent user experience that you have on your laptop or in other clouds, you'll have consistently here as well, because it's, again, just coming back to portability. Now, in IBM Cloud, we've standardized on the Kubernetes service to deliver our software in a consistent, more secure, and easier to oper operate manner. So when you think typically about container workloads, you think things like stateless applications, web apps, and that's true. A bulk of the IBM platform that runs, whether it's identity and access management or the web console or some of these more container ready type applications, they run there as well. But we also have very resource intensive workloads like IBM Cloud Databases, which is our managed database offering, all runs on the Kubernetes service. As a consumer of a database, you don't know or care that it's running on IKS. You just want your Mongo, your Redis, your whatever type of database. You want it up and ready to go. But by building on top of IKS, then the, uh, the, the database team that allows them to focus on new updates from, from the database perspective, not running and maintaining that infrastructure. When we bring on partners to the catalog, whether it's Sysdig for monitoring or LogDNA for logging, those all run on Kubernetes. Kubernetes provides that consistent abstraction and layer to be able to deploy and run those workloads. And obviously, OpenShift is built on Kubernetes as well. So you'll see a common building block layer to be able to run and deploy those workloads. And I say that not to you know, brag about the amount of workload running on ICAS, although I'm very proud of the amount and diverse workloads that run there, but really it's about availability. It's about meeting that SLA. It's about being able to automatically scale out resources to meet your use cases, your requirements, your capacity needs for your end users. Now, as we fast forward and think about the Red Hat acquisition and what does that mean? What does it mean with upstream Kubernetes versus OpenShift? Well, the answer from an IBM perspective, and I think Roman touched on this earlier, is about Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud. We've taken all of the operational experience that we've built over the past two and a half years running our public Kubernetes service, and essentially we've added a new cluster flavor for OpenShift. So if you're using OpenShift on-prem, now it's an easier transition to cloud because you've got a consistent model to be able to run that workloads. In OpenShift, you're using things like routes and are different from ingress and load balancers in Kubernetes. So it gives you that consistent migration path from on-prem into cloud. And of course, you know, we're really focused on leveraging the rest of the IBM portfolio. So making a one stop for monitoring and logging and security insights, and also consuming the Watson and the other services in the platform. So the number one thing that I get asked is about security. Everyone that's ready to start that transformation, that movement of workloads to cloud, they want to know about security. How is my workload isolated? How is my data secured? How can I ensure that it's customer managed keys? How can I ensure that no one else is viewing or has access to any of that data or compute? The next thing that I get asked is, okay, all of this sounds great, but who's actually using it? Who's using it in a productive manner and at such a scale that gives me trust and belief in how you run your offerings? So the first example, as I mentioned earlier, was Maersk. And the reason I like them is because Maersk, the physical container shipping company, has modernized their application on software containers. And when they started this journey about three years ago, they came to us and said, you know, we've got some key architectural tenants that we want to deliver. The first is that we want it completely API driven. 
The second thing is they wanted it completely segregated from the Maersk network. The third thing is that they wanted it portable. They wanted to be able to take that workload and move it elsewhere if they had to. And then the last thing, and this was the thing that really kind of gave me pause and concern as the owner of the offering, was that they said, we need five nines of uptime. 99.999. If you're not good at your SLA math, that essentially means five minutes of downtime per year. Five minutes in a calendar year. So obviously I was very concerned about that. That leaves very little room for outages, issues, things that come up. I mean, the reality is we're running on hardware and software and things fail. Networks fail, networks drop. So how do we architect a solution that allows them to get this 99.999% SLA that they needed? So fast forward, uh, and we architected a solution that's running in multiple regions with a global load balancer that sits over it and can handle any type of outage or upgrade at any particular region. Two months ago, we got a note with, that Maersk had celebrated two years of 100% uptime for this application. So we're really excited, obviously, about that because this is the application that tracks physical containers from any port or on any ship across the world. Think about 80% of the world's goods are still on ocean freighters. They're shipped from one port to another. Eventually, they get in a truck and they get sent somewhere. So this application is extremely important to all of their customers that are running manufacturing lines and production lines. They need whatever is inside those physical containers to get there. They need to know when it will deliver. So we're really excited uh, about that example to be able to meet that very stringent requirement. Whoop, too far. The next example is the weather company. When we acquired the weather company a few years ago, they weren't running on IBM Cloud. And in fact, they weren't even running as a containerized solution yet. They were running in virtual machines. Once we closed that acquisition, and we closed it because weather is important to all of us, whether you're in retail or travel, essentially, uh, especially because weather is going to affect how, how they operate, how they plan, how they handle routes. So weather data is very important. That's the reason IBM acquired them. So fast forward, we went through the first step, which was to containerize their workload. And then the second thing was to move it over to IKS, our managed Kubernetes service. Now, literally within one week of completely turning off the lights from the old environment and going 100% on within IKS and IBM Cloud, there were two major hurricanes that hit the eastern United States in North Carolina. Again, I'm panicking again because now it's literally life and death. I'm going to my web app. I'm going to a browser. I am trying to find out where the storm is, how strong is it, where's the flooding, what's the wind strength. These are all things that are very important if you're in that path of those hurricanes. So, Fast forward, fortunately, with the right auto-scaling policies on the container level as well as the infrastructure level, they were able to scale up and accommodate all of those requests. And you think about 250 billion API calls, 250 billion, whether that's loads on a mobile app or checking a browser or the weather channel pulling data in real time. Obviously, a lot of transactional data that happened during those periods, and they're able to scale up and down based on those weather needs. And then the last example that I want to share is American Airlines. And this is uh, an airline in, based out of the United States. And the reason I like them is they're using a range of compute options and a, comp a range of offerings from within IBM Cloud. Obviously, they're using the Kubernetes service for a lot of workloads. They've gone through and taken AA.com, their customer-facing portal, 
and refactored it to microservices to run in a more efficient manner. When you think about a travel website, everyone envision a travel website, and you've got different window panes, essentially. Each of those window panes is a distinct microservice. So I've got one place where I can check my existing reservations. I've got one place where I can book something new. I've got one place where I can see specials that they're offering. Each of those can scale up or add new capabilities independently of the rest of that architecture. And that's really the benefit of leveraging microservices and containers is to give you that flexibility. Of course, they're using things like Cloud Foundry and VMware on IBM Cloud, which was kind of the first step of taking existing workloads. They wanted to get out of the data center business and move that workload into a consistent VMware environment on IBM Cloud and then modernize that workload, whether it's with Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or Cloud Functions, but to be able to modernize that at a pace that is efficient and effective for them. So at this point, inevitably you're thinking, wow, everything you just said sounds awesome about IBM Cloud. I am very excited to get started. Maybe I've not tried it yet, but now I'm gonna go home tonight. I'm gonna create an account. How can you IBM help me go faster? So there's a few ways. One of them is, you know, through a staged approach. Think about starting small, we're not gonna move the entire data center tomorrow in one swoop. We're gonna start with one project. We're gonna start with one team. We're gonna start with one ideal candidate to run through a proof of concept. We're gonna pick one or two or a small handful of services to meet those needs. We're gonna help you be successful. We're gonna ensure that you are successful. Then we're gonna to continue to iterate. We're gonna add new projects. We're gonna add new teams. We're gonna scale that up. We're gonna give you the rest of the power of IBM Cloud Services to help make that first app and existing apps smarter. Now, the other way that we can help is through what's called the IBM Cloud Garage. The garage is essentially a, a way to come in and help you become an entrepreneur. It's gonna help your organization move faster. The way it works, you have your real business problem. It's not IBM says, here's a problem, let's solve it. You come in and say, IBM, here is my problem. I don't know how to get started. I don't know how to solve it. So with this defined problem, we go through design thinking. If you've not gone through a design thinking workshop, I'll boil it down to 10 seconds. You're gonna start and you're gonna go through a thousand little post-it notes. And on those post-it notes, you're gonna collaboratively write down things like, who are my personas? What do they want to accomplish? How do they do it today? And what's the future state that we want to deliver? And at the end of that garage workshop, you have an, an MVP, a minimal viable product to prototype solving your real problem. Then you can continue to iterate and grow on that we have, I think, roughly 15 garage locations worldwide. If one of those locations doesn't work to you or your team is too big and it's more efficient, then the garage can come to you. I'm sure they would love to come down to Buenos Aires and come and talk to you about your problems and help you solve your problems. This is essentially what it looks like when, when you come down and it's very collaborative. Think about code developing together. Co um, programming pairing where you sit down together, you're writing code, you're checking code, all of this following that initial design thinking workshop. And at the end, like I said, you've got something that's real and tangible and usable. American Airlines went through one of these workshops and in less than three weeks went from design thinking to running this application in production. This was an internal facing application that they used. It was essentially a, uh, a health registration. When you think about a company and everyone has to go on and pick what do I want for health coverage and dental and eyes and all that sort of thing. So that was their first step in Kubernetes and using the garage to help accelerate that. Once it proved out and they were comfortable with the technology and the process, then that allowed them to move much faster and bring on additional workloads. 
All right, so I think that is all of my time. Um, I've got my email address and my Twitter handle. This was not a great forum for a lot of back and forth Q&A, um, but I encourage you to reach out in either forum, and I'm glad to expand on anything that we touched on, because obviously we covered a lot very, very quickly. Uh, answer questions, help set up that garage, help give you a demo, run a workshop, you know, whatever you guys need, that's what we're here to deliver.